Sherberg. I'm the publisher of the Business Journal, and I'm delighted you could all be with us today. Um, Kelly Rowland, when, who really put all of this together for the Business Journal, said that she'd never seen so many iPads walk into one room um, for a Business Journal seminar. So I thought I would do my own survey and ask, how many of you like have an iPad right now on you? Yeah. So how many of those are iPad 3s? In the back? So is it worth it? Yeah. What do you think? Is it worth it? Yeah? There you go. <laughs> well, usually, in deference to AT&T, we don't tell people to turn their cell phones off at meetings like this, but I got to tell you, it's very hard to get service. I don't think it's a big issue. <laughs> um, but speaking of cell phones and iPads and AT&T and service, I was wondering how many of you got um, an email from me this morning? So how many of you didn't? What's wrong with you? Um, every morning, the Business Journal pushes an email out. It's free. <laughs> And if you had gotten the one this morning, you would know that the city public schools are looking for big cuts. You would know that Walgreens um, had a pretty crappy quarter. Um, you would actually know a lot of things that you need to, we think, to go along your business day. And I think I said this, but it's free. And so we have lots of business journal people around. Can the people who represent us just sort of wait? And I'm here. And so if you give us your business cards, we can sign you up for this. It's a daily email update. And truly, there are no strings attached. We just believe that by having a better informed community, we'll have a more successful community. And the more successful you are, the more successful we are. Today's program is just a little different from our usual seminar format. What it has in common with everything we do is that it's going to end on time. So at 9 o'clock, the formal program's over. Before that time, we're going to be able to learn a great deal about hacking computer security, um, security both in terms <clears throat> of the physical security and your um, risk and liability. And There'll be a few questions that I'm going to ask, and afterwards, um, our speakers have been gracious enough, both Dave and Brian, to say that they're going to stick around. Because we think that if you have real security questions, the last thing you're going to do is raise your hand and ask them in an open um, forum. So, so they've been, been really kind enough to, to make accommodations for that, so you can speak to each of them individually. So, I'm going to read Dave Cronister's entire biography. I don't usually do this, but I've never actually been able to um, say some of these words, and I've never been able to introduce somebody <coughs> as a certified <coughs> ethical hacker. So, please welcome Dave Cronister. He's the co-founder and managing partner of Parameter Security. As a certified ethical hacker and a certified information secure system security professional, Dave possesses deep security expertise in some of the most heavily regulated industries. Those include financial services and healthcare. Specifically, Sarbanes-Oxley, Gramm-Leach-Billiac, the payment card industries, and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. Cutting his teeth on technology at the age of five, Dave gained an instant attraction to the inner workings of his computer. Before he was eight, Dave wrote his first computer software program. And by the time he was a teenager, he ran one of St. Louis's biggest network built bulletin board systems. It was about at this time that Dave experienced war dialing, and he first encountered the underworld of hacking. During the course of his professional career, Dave has served as an architect for A.G. Edwards Electronic Messaging System. And that was the largest exchange server deployment at that time. At CyberSource, Dave was the technical liaison to the various credit card organizations that, that were developing their own payment card compliance systems. 
Additionally, working with numerous medical and dental practices, Dave served as technical advisor. He helped them meet their HIPAA compliance. Recently, Dave served as the chief technology officer for a $700 million bank holding company. And he did that for about five years, and then he started Parameter Security. I think you're going to really enjoy, and maybe be a little scared, by some of the things that Dave has to say. Joining Dave this morning is Brian Hoglund. Hoglund, right? I'm gonna Hoglund. Say, I'm going to say it wrong about every time. It's okay. No, it's not. <laughs> say it right. You say it right. Hoglund. Hoglund. <laughs> Got it? All right. Brian Hoglund. Brian's the Senior VP of Executive Risk at Huntley McGee. He graduated from Center College in 1987 with degrees in economics and English. He also attended the London School of Economics. Brian worked in various underwriting and management positions in Chubb's Executive Protection Department from 1987 to 1993. Then he joined Marsha McLennan in Chicago, where he worked 14 years managing the Midwest Financial and Professional Group. His entire career has been focused on consulting and placing coverage with respect to management liability products, including directors and officers, employment practices, ERISA liability and professional liability, and including cyber liability. Brian joined Huntley McGee in 2009. He manages their executive risk practice, including, of course, cyber liability. And that's pretty much my part of the program. So now I'm going to welcome Dave and your chef. <laughs> they said watch over here. So what do I do? I fall. Thanks, Alan. How's everyone doing this morning? Awesome. Awesome. So I'm working on 45 minutes of sleep, a five hour energy, a monster energy drink, and two sodas. So <laughs> we are ready to go. Social engineering in 20 minutes or less. Um, OK, so my name is Dave Cronister, as I want to explain to you. I've been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, I, I will want to say, uh, Ellen, I have a tablet PC, um, not an iPad. There are other options. I'm not going to say too much, except from a security perspective, we do not allow any Apple products on our networks. Take it as you will. I know they have commercials that say they're secure. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. But today we're talking about social engineering. What is social engineering? This is hacking the human. Now, the definition is the clever manipulation of, nat of the natural human tendency to trust. Right? Yeah. No, this is what everybody thinks, right? Because there's no patch for stupidity. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, I teach a class worldwide called Certified Ethical Hacker. I'm one of the top trainers for them. I teach people in the Cyber Warfare Department. I teach people at the NSA. This is what they're told. This is incorrect, OK? If you think that the only reason people get social engineered is because they're stupid, there is absolutely zero point for user security awareness training. If I'm able to socially engineer you because you're stupid, if I come in and do a social engineering exam, they should fire you if you let me in, right? Because there's no patch. That is not true. Get it out of your head. Everybody here can and has been social engineered in their life. Now, let's talk about real quick what causes, so, uh, why social engineering is successful. Um, we have enough time. Can we do a demonstration? Is everybody good with that? I know it's 8 o'clock. I know it's 8 o'clock. It's a rainy day. But all right, so I need a volunteer. There was someone earlier I picked on sitting in the back. I won't pick on you, I promise. Um, I'm going to pick on you, though. Hi, Teresa. My name's Dave. Nice to meet you. Teresa, you look like a very smart lady. You have glasses. That makes you smart, right? All right. So what we're going to do, social engineering is like an optical illusion. Everybody's seen like little tricks like, um, that, you, that you can do where I can show you one thing. But you're going to, if I make you look at it from a certain standpoint, you are going to, um, see if I have a 20. <laughs> I'm a married man. I don't get that. All I get is a dollar. 
uh, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the information and it's going to give you, look at this, the lady pulls out the 20. She probably has a bunch of crisp 20s in there. Thank you, Cindy. You're a sweetheart. Thank you. No. <laughs> All right. So what I want you to do, can, say hello. Can everybody hear her? OK, you got to talk louder. I have a very small microphone. I'll say hello. hello. Everybody here now? Yeah. OK. Now, first, what we want to do is we want to clear your mind. We can't, you're biased right now. So I'm going to give you a couple questions. Just answer them off. They're easy. There's nothing to it, OK? What's 1 plus 1? 10 plus 3? 10 minus 5. five. Name a vegetable. Zucchini. See, you're thinking. That's the problem. Let's try again, OK? You got you to gotta really. Now, is everybody playing along here? Let me ask you a question. How many people thought of this? Thanks for being a good sport, Teresa. So um, the thing about it is, is that 90% of all people, hey, this is my speech here. This is my speech here. OK. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing as a free breakfast. So, ah. <laughs> thanks, Cindy. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, 90% um, of you thought carrot, right? I picked Teresa, and Teresa obviously is one of the 10 percenters. But raise your hand. You thought you, who picked carrot? Yeah. You know why? Because there's human nature. Human nature says, if I give you a bunch of mathematics and then I ask you to pick a vegetable, we automatically think carrot. OK? What does this mean? Humans are predictable. The other thing is, I, to be successful in social engineering, I rely on emotion. Now, Cindy was a sweetheart. She said, this poor boy. This poor, dumb boy did not prepare. I will give him a $20 bill. This is how I'm successful. If I can get you to think from an emotional standpoint rather than logically, I'm going to win every time. It doesn't matter the logic. If I can get you mad at me, if I can get you to think I'm an idiot, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I am still going to get in, OK? Now, why do we pick social engineering? And again, this is something I could speak three days on. I was actually, I was telling Ellen, you guys should feel special. I had a paid trip. And to get paid, I was right now I should be speaking at a hacking convention in Oslo, Norway. But I picked you. So, um, so. I, I could speak hours on this, but we'll, 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 um, we have to keep it short. Ellen said, on time, on time. And I said, OK, I'm German. I understand being on time. We're efficient. We're ready to go. All right, why social engineering? Because with social engineering, I am hacking a human being. And not just any human being. I'm hacking a human being that has privileged access. But Dave, I'm just a user. You have privileged access. You have access to your network. Now, what you're going to hear makes you think I'm talking about the boogeyman. I want you to understand this is how we are getting in all the time. I spend hours upon day, I have the best job in the world, I spend hours upon day browsing the internet on hacking sites. Social engineering is the way to get in. I don't care if you have a firewall. Because if I do social engineering right, I'm going to bypass it. I do not have to hack your environment. For some reason, this is the mentality of everybody. We're going to build this big network. And we're going to build this big, big firewall. And we're going to have all these devices. And we're going to have you know, a midget sitting there with a machine gun ready to shoot anybody who comes in. It's going to be secure. And that's where everybody's going to come in. That's not how it works. How does every battle start? 
You have your strong fronts. And then what does someone try to do? They flank you. They try to get to your weaknesses. Your humans are the weakness. Why do you think I'm going to spend the time to hack your servers, your firewall, when I know that you're browsing Facebook applications at lunch and I can set up Trojans there? And by the way, if you are on Facebook applications, there's a very good chance that you've already been infected. If I can write a Trojan that's undetectable, there's a good chance I can pick out what kind of vegetable am I for an application. It's the path of least resistance. I will ask you when I show a demo here, who would fall for this? And I can guarantee everybody's going to say no. Well, of course you're not going to. You're in a session talking about social engineering. But if we were really honest about with ourselves, we all would fall for some of these. If I can hit a bunch of people, I am going to get in. Physical, from a physical standpoint, I am able to leave cyberspace and enter what I call meat space. The, as they say in Matrix, the real world, us. Okay. I'm going to tell you a scenario here. I do social engineering on site where I walk in the door. Okay? I'm armed with only a few tools and my contract down in my pants. Now, sounds kind of weird, um, but in the industry, we call that our get out of jail free card. Why? Because every circumstance if the security is working the way it should be working, I should be talking to security guards. I should be talking to police. And there's a very good chance I'm going to get arrested. My God, jail free card will actually show I'm supposed to be doing this and maybe keep me, only keep me in jail for a couple hours. I've been doing this for going on five to six years and I have yet to even show it to anybody. Okay? Now, let me explain to you one of the scenarios. I, I tell this scenario all the time. I w there's some other ones that are kind of newer, but this is a really good one. Um, 2008, I was contacted by a credit union in Las Vegas, and they said, we want to see if you can come in to our network. I have to check my time. I always run over. Um, see if you can get into our network walking through the front door. Okay. Well, you know, Vegas, that's a hardship tour. I'm taking that gig. <laughs> so I went there. Uh, now, three locations. And, um, you know, real quick, one of the things you do is you set up a story. Again, if I set up a story, um, I will be able to get, if I can get someone to follow this story, then we're going to be good. And, and Cindy, I really didn't have a 20. I, I, I'm not allowed to have that much money. Um, so my story was I was an uh, exterminator, and I was coming in to give free sprays, okay? I will come in, give a free spray. My, uh, it, the, the spray was the best. You know, it kills everything. It doesn't smell. It's greener. Whatever you want to say about it, it was that spray, okay? And then I'll come back two weeks later, see if you thought it was better. I'll give you a quote. Anytime you don't want to move forward, we're good, all right? Now, the only things I'm armed with are a wireless access point, because that's what a lot of us do. If I can get into your, into your building one time, I plug in a wireless access point, so now I can access it from outside. It's good. The other was a USB key with what we call a Trojan. Trojan gives me access to your system. Okay. And because I've learned whenever I do these things, if no matter how bad it is, the end user says, oh, it really wasn't that bad. So I arm myself with this. This is a spy camera. Like I said, I have the coolest job in the world. This is a buttonhole camera. It goes right here. By the way, bad guys use this. Because if I can maybe go in and get you typing on your computer, it's aimed, and then I can watch your keystrokes. So I go into the first location. Now I have my story set up. And by the way, I went to Home Depot when I was there, but got a bug spraying thing, filled it with water, all sorts of stuff. I walk in the first location. I say, I'm a bug guy. Here's spray. And they say, oh, OK, where do you want to start? 
in the office or in the vault? <laughs> I'll start in the office and move my way into the vault. 15 minutes in and out, I had infected every single system, including their ATM system. Now, those of you that have worked at a bank before understand that a bank always has this secure outer shell. Inside, it's very vulnerable. The inside of a bank, inside of an ATM, is usually nothing more than a closet with a safe and a computer on there. Now, with a spray, what was great about it is, who really wants to be around the computer when you're spraying? No one. 15 minutes in and out. Second location, I walk in. Bug guy, here to spray. Lady looks at me and she says, you ain't a normal bug guy. I need to see ID. Well, now, I don't carry my wallet. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. I have a Missouri driver's license. I have fake business cards. So I come up to her and I say, oh, oh I don't have my wallet. Listen, I'm already been late today. I'm afraid, you know, can I give you my business card? I live all the way in Henderson. If I'm, you know, I can go get it, but my boss may fire me. Now, I'm trying to elicit a... Um, uh, sympathy. And I did elicit emotion, but it wasn't sympathy. It was more like, you're an idiot. Because I give her the card, and she literally looks at the person next to her and says, look at this. I asked for ID. He gives me a business card. All right, come on in. Let's me in. <laughs> and what was even better is, remember, I'm on camera. I'm, I'm camera. I have a camera going. Opens up the door, frames it, and says, you know, sorry about being a jerk and all but we are a bank. We have to worry about security. I said, yeah, I hope my bank's this secure. So moved in. 20 minutes in and out. Now, not only did I get every system, but some of their systems were actually to open. And again, there's this thing called core processing system. This is where your bank account information is. It was open and unlocked. I started clicking and getting into that. Um, also, anybody here ever work at a bank before? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember that awkward first moment when you walked into a room full of money and you're the only person in there? We all have it. Change day. All of a sudden, money doesn't mean anything when you're in a bank. Um, and I remember that. But I'm the bug guy. I walk into the vault and there is $60,000, $70,000 worth of cash sitting in there. They didn't think anything of it. Okay. So now, if you're keeping track, this is a billion dollar holding company. I have taken over two thirds of the network. Okay. This is the point I should have gone to Columbia. <laughs> they don't have extradition laws there, right? Um, but I moved to the third one. Now, the third one was the main headquarters. And it had, uh, a, it had a teenager that was there working on a, as the receptionist. And at this point, I'm telling her, yeah, here's spray. Well, sir, do you have an appointment? No. I start ex so I had to go back to my pretense. She's not letting me in. 10 minutes goes by. Finally, I realized it's up. So I said, listen, my name's not Ted Miller. It's really Dave Crosser. I'm with Parameter Security. So-and-so here. And this is the IT director. And she goes, sir, I told you, if you want to spray our facility, you have to make an appointment. <laughs> Took me another 10 minutes just to get her to get in there. Well, long story short, I go up. I start talking to the executive board. And I said, you know, I have my DVR here. Let's look at it. Now, we start from the last to the first. That first one, man, they're virtual high five, and they're like, this is how we do it. Second one, a little bit nervous. The first one, they freaked out. Okay, now the second one I thought was the worst. But I start talking to them, and they're like, were they nervous at all? No. We were having a good time. I even found a cockroach. I mean, it was, it was insane. Um, why? They were robbed yesterday afternoon for $30,000, and the president had just left 15 minutes before I came in saying, hey, we need to be diligent because we were just robbed. I walked in, hey, I'm the bug guy. Where do you want to go? Vault or office. Do you see where this goes? Okay. Now, I uh, want real quick, I want to show you a, a quick movie here, and uh, then we'll move it over to Brian. Now, I'm just going to show you a, a little tool. One of the things I find in my job is a lot of people go, how many people actually know how to do this? It's easier than you think. So I created a quick movie. It's called Create a Phishing Website, Tag Your Company, and Ruin Your Day in Less Than Five Minutes. Guess how long this is? Less than five minutes. So let's go through this, and let's talk a little bit about it. Before we start, remember, 
remember, this is illegal. Don't attempt. You will go to jail, and that is bad. So we're going to look at a tool called the Social Engineering Toolkit. Now, I real quick, I want to show you some of the attacks I can do with the Social Engineering Toolkit. I can do spear phishing. This is spoofed emails, set up a fake website. I can create infection, infected media, USB keys that I throw in your parking lot. I can even go in and create a wireless access point that when you connect to it, I get access to your system. All the way down to I can create a QR code. A QR code is those little things you hit with your, with your phone. Well, guess what? When you hit with your phone, I've just infected your phone. We're going to do a website. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in. Now, it gives me options. This is menu driven, people. It's easy. I'm going to come in and I'm going to hit two for web, website attack vectors. Now, there's different things I can do once I hit two. I can come in and set up a malicious Java applet, or I can use other exploits. I'm going to do the Java applet because, understand, it is not a vulnerability. It's a program. Now, I can actually use one of their web templates, or I can create my own. People go, wow. That website looks real. Well, of course it does. And I actually get, went over it. We're going to go ahead and create businessjournal.com forward slash St. Louis. It's the only company I could do without offending anybody. So it comes in, it creates it. Now, what's my payload? My payload, I want, when you execute that system, I want you to actually connect back to me. Okay? Now, how am I going to bypass antivirus? Yeah, they say this is the best way. I don't know what it means, but it's 16. I do know what it means, but it doesn't matter. How do I want to listen? OK. Now, it, I just created my Windows vulnerabilities. I'm backdooring it to bypass your antivirus. OK. I'm uh, creating a Macintosh malware. I didn't think Macs got viruses. You know. That mentality of thinking that Macs don't get viruses are like saying I drive a Volvo because they don't get into Rex. Remember, I said I don't allow Apple on my network. Any company that in their model says we are safe and secure and they are knowingly lying to you because on their website they will admit it is not allowed on my network. The only two things that stop me from infecting your system is A, antivirus, and B, getting someone to click on it. Everybody that has an Apple, raise your hand if you have antivirus on your system. Do you remember how many people had Apples? Now, how many people click on everything because you think they don't get infected? Yeah. Remember that. And remember, when you have your iPhones, your Androids, your Blackberries, your Macintoshes, everything on the, your network, they are going to put all of your systems at risk. I'm also creating a backdoor to Linux. These are OSs. I'm installing an application. No one is safe. So it goes in. It installs my stuff. Now, what I need to do is create a phishing website. And fortunately, Ellen sent a nice phishing website from Ellen saying that St. Louis Business Journal is hosting a presidential debate. And if you want to give a question, go to the website and you may be able to meet the presidential candidates. I even give a URL. Now, this bypassed all of your spam filter. Now, we click on it. When we click on it, remember, I've already created the phishing site. The system, this is a phishing site. The system automatically injected, and what you're going to see is a Java applet come up. Well, this is required. Do you want to run it? How many people do you think will actually run it? Well, right when we run it, if we go look at what's going on on the other side, and oh, by the way, it then redirects you to the right one, I've just opened up a session to your system. It's that easy. Now, the different things I can do, and I show some, I can get into your shell. I can take website. I can take HTML snapshots. I am now on your network. Okay? This is how we work. Now, I'm going to real quick wrap up here.
Um, understand, the tool I just gave you, I just showed, is free. It's downloaded all the time. It is available. Almost every tool that we use in the hacking world is a legal tool to download. Now, you need an effective security program to protect yourself. Programs and policies. Do not skimp on your policies and procedures. That's more important than the technology. Your defense in depth. That means don't rely on just antivirus on your server. Don't rely on just one door. You need to have multiple controls protecting you. A good security awareness program. If your employees, be it end users all the way up to system administrators, don't know what they're facing, how do you expect them to protect your company? Incident response. What happens when you do get hit? When I get a call, you know, there's a lot of people. I had a client two weeks ago called me. FBI just called me. Um, they said my system was involved in a malicious attack. Can you make it up to Chicago? Hey, you want to guess how much I charged them? I could charge them a lot more because he was in pain. When you are in pain, that's the last place you want to be on starting to do your vendor due diligence. And remember, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Real quick before I hand it over to my colleague here, what you just saw, I can almost guarantee if you look on your network, you will find an infection like that somewhere on your network. So it's not maybe even a matter of when, it may be when will you detect it. Thanks. Remember, that's Dave with 45 minutes of sleep. <laughs> Imagine what he's like with six hours. Um, uh, my purpose here today is <clears throat> to give an overview of what the cyber liability insurance market uh, looks like today. How many of you have considered uh, or secured a quote for cyber liability? Any of your firms? A few of you. It's bad. Um, in 2000, <clears throat> the coverage was really limited to just internet liability companies. And uh, I was talking to Ed out at the, um, at the company breakfast this morning, where very few people, it was almost like the employment practices liability market in 1991, where the application process was very prohibitive and frankly, the, the binding of the coverage uh, was somewhat limited. And in 2000, uh, really it was just advertisement website coverage. And that would pick up for essentially defamation, libel, slander, plagiarism, uh, infringement of copyright, infringement of trademark, and at the time the coverage was limited to only electronic media. Uh, today, that coverage, which is media liability or content injury, is still a part of cyber liability, but it really is only one very small part of the overall coverage. And the coverage has been expanded to not just be electronic media, uh, but any form of advertisement uh, in any medium. And so any print, any mailers that you do, uh, and certainly anything that you have on your website is now going to be covered. So it, yeah, again, it's significantly different than where it was uh, 12 years ago. While this is a small part of the overall scope of coverage, uh, it certainly is important. So what I want to do is just give you an overview <coughs> of what the scope of coverage looks like uh, in today's market. Uh, with regard to supply and demand, uh, like anything, the more insurance companies that come into the market, and when in 2000 we probably had three insurance carriers uh, that would afford the coverage, and the total capacity or the total limits available might have been 25 million. Today you have upwards of 15 insurance companies uh, that offer the coverage. Uh, generally, their limits are <coughs> $10 million, some offer actually greater, up to $20 million for network security. And so the <clears throat> compared to $30 million in capacity in 2000, today you're probably looking at a quarter of a billion dollars. Now, not many companies buy that much, uh, but, but certainly it, it is available uh, on a primary and excess basis. The application process is, has become much more streamlined. There are, and uh, you know, with regard to Dave's company, primary security, there are uh, certain underwriters that require third-party assessments, that require penetration tests, and it really depends upon the size and scope of the insured. 
Um, there are companies, uh, Allied World Assurance in particular, that offers a tech one-on-one -on -one for any company that isn't heavily involved in credit cards flights. And essentially that would be any company that has less than 50,000. They have a tech one-on-one, -on -one, which with revenues and with your website, uh, you can secure a quote. And it is a very user-friendly product, easy to apply for. The other thing that's changed is the regulatory environment. I'm not going to get heavily into that today uh, because hacking is quite sexy. Uh, talking about HIPAA and uh, Graham Leach is not very sexy. So I'm not going to go into um, you know, a great deal of what's going on from a regulatory standpoint, except you're familiar with HIPAA. Uh, you know what's going on with Graham Leach. There are 48 states now that have notification laws. Uh, I think what's important to know there is you have to comply. If you were to have a data breach, it's not where you're located. It's where the individuals that are impacted are located. And so if you operate in a multi-state um, uh, geography, you have, you have to comply with each state where the, the individuals uh, whose information has, has been breached. And so, Various states might require that you only post on your website that there's been a data breach. Some require that you send certified mail. Uh, some require that you take an advertisement in, uh, in a newspaper. And so again, there are different standards that apply to different states. And there are 48 individual states that currently have notification laws. So the regulatory environment has really heightened uh, the awareness of this and, uh, and demand for the coverage. So how will, a, uh, <clears throat> how will a data breach impact you? Uh, first and foremost is, is the reputation damage. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with TJ Maxx. Um, when you think of TJ Maxx, you don't think of uh, cost-effective goods. You know, frankly, you think that some 65 million people have their credit cards uh, information breached. Uh, Visa and MasterCard brought suit against them. I think that settled for somewhere upwards of uh, $60 million. And again, that was for the cost of replacing credit cards from the customers. And then there were class action suits brought by uh, the individual customers themselves uh, who were essentially inconvenienced or, or uh, alleged emotional distress as a result. So that's a reputational damage. Certainly uh, brand degradation potentially lost customers and uh, financial repercussions. Uh, again, lawsuits that could be brought by credit card companies, potentially regulatory bodies that could impose fines or penalties against you if you have a breach, and certainly the customers themselves. One of the things that, uh, <clears throat> that we talk to our clients about is with regard to cyber liability is the first party laws. And there are two sections of the policy. There's first party, <coughs> You don't have to have a lawsuit. If you have a breach of your data, and this could be personal information that you can house, or the policies actually extend to corporate information. So if you have confidential information, uh, be it patent information, uh, if, if you're a law firm and you have securities information uh, on behalf of a client, if you have trust information, it, it's not just personal identifiable information. It, it extends to um, to corporate uh, corporate information that you can house that is subject to a confidentiality agreement. And really, I think one of the benefits on the first party uh, side of the house is if you were to have a breach, you would have to know which law firm to call to provide the appropriate notification in 48 states or however many states uh, your customers or individuals are located in. The, what I, I call this the concierge services, essentially the, um, the insurance companies have already set up law firms, a network of law firms across the country. That if you were to have a breach, essentially you take your problem, get it to the insurance company, they know the law firms that are gonna provide the notification. They have public relation firms. Uh, there are going to be limits of liability up to a million dollars that essentially is going to protect your reputation. Uh, and that could be advertising, press releases, etc. Uh, in addition, the insurance companies have already set up uh, facilities with credit monitoring firms like TransUnion. 
where you have to offer that for a certain period of time, depending upon the state. And uh, your customers or your employees uh, will have 24-7 access to monitor their, their, their credit. Forensic, um, <coughs> for firms like Dave's, uh, the policy, again, is a first party, so we have a breach, we don't have a lawsuit, but uh, a firm like Parameter Security uh, that's going to be partnered with many, with uh, the insurance companies affording the coverage, they are going to come in and tell you how the breach occurred and how we prevent it from happening again. And these are typically written with very low deductibles because what the insurance company wants to do is to provide you with remediation of the loss. And if you get ahead of the game, and if you can determine how it happened, how we can prevent it, provide the notification, provide the credit monitoring, that hopefully is going to lessen the third party liability that you can incur. And lastly, it's not, it's, you know, the legal just responding to any claim received that might arise. Other first uh, party coverage, network extortion. Um, there was actually a firm here in St. Louis um, that received a call that we are in your computer system and we're going to manipulate your data. If you wire us $2 million, we won't do it. Uh, this was uh, public knowledge, but uh, I'll, I'll withhold the name, but uh, they might be here. But, uh, uh, you know, essentially, network extortion is covered. So if someone hacks into your system, essentially, if they want extortion money to not manipulate your data, the policy is going to pay on your behalf. Uh, network loss, again, first party coverage here, uh, this is the cost to restore, restore your network, uh, which firms like Dave's could come in and assist with. And lastly, business interruption. To the extent your system's downtime is costing you income, typically there's a six hour waiting period for this coverage. Uh, but once you exceed that, then again, the policy is going to reimburse you for loss of income. That's the first party loss that's afforded by the coverage. There's also a third party, <clears throat> the network security liability. Again, this would be customers or individuals that could bring suit against you for failing to protect their data. Uh, regulatory fines and penalties, whether it's HIPAA, whether it's grand leash, whether it's a state uh, law that you potentially could be subject to for not adequately protecting the data, for not hiring firms like Dave's that uh, um, can essentially show that you've done the due diligence, uh, that you have the proper controls in place. And lastly, the content injury, which is where I started, that was the coverage that was available uh, in 2000. It's media liability or content uh, for your advertising. And that is it. And I think we are uh, set to get with 15 minutes ago. So we can answer your question. Thank you. All of you might, or many of you, be interested in, and I would have the opportunity to ask them. And then, as I said, we'll wait a few minutes, and we can come up individually and talk to Dave and Brian. But I was wondering, Brian, in order to obtain cyber liability coverage, which I now feel I need since Dave had hopes, um, what what are the requirements and? Um, What's the application process like? And can I afford it? Yes, you can afford it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the application process, there is going to be a minimum requirement that you have to show that you have done some third party assessment. It doesn't have to be necessarily a full application test, but there are uh, questions specifically with regard to what protections do you have in place, what can you disclose to the underwriters. Uh, it is much more streamlined than it was uh, 10 years ago, but I can tell you the greater the, if you're hiring outside parties on the base to do third party assessment or penetration tests, it's going to benefit you with your costs. Now, having said that, uh, despite the fact of how easy Dave made it look to have to do a system, the cost is relatively affordable. Um, I, you know, if you're not a major retail chain that's swiping millions of credit cards a year, you're probably looking at a million dollars a month. It's going to be somewhere between eight and ten thousand dollars. And since every company is 
is uh, susceptible to uh, whether it's manufacturing or healthcare or retail. Uh, you're, you're susceptible to having a, a virus or, or a attack that will into your system. It's not overly cost prohibitive for what I need to get in return. So, Dan, how much is it going to cost for me to have you come and make it so that I can spend eight thousand dollars? You owe me eight dollars. Yeah. Well, to me, I think um, already got it. Yeah. Again, uh, we always go against a lot of every. They're everything to everybody. We are a specialized shop. Um, so with us, so we look by. Uh, you're talking anywhere from twenty-five hundred dollars all the way up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, depending on the size. Um, but I will, I will echo what Brian said. My uh, my penetration rates are half of my forensic rates. So it, easily, I, there are many times I have ten thousand dollar weekends just on forensic. It's good for me, but it really feels bad for the client. So to that point, are there technologies that would prevent the attack that you demonstrated today, or or other social um, engineering attacks? The simple answer is no. No, I'm, I'm going to, here, here's, here's the one thing to understand is you cannot expect a computer to protect you against a human being. A human being will always find a weakness, okay? Control programs, solutions, I'm not saying you don't have them, but you need to make sure that they are tools that meet into a larger security program. Just assuming, again, I have antivirus, I'm good. I have a firewall, I'm good. You're setting yourself up for false sense of security. So make sure you have defense in depth, multiple tools. Make sure you have the tools you need. Don't just, the security program's not just on a hodgepodge of tools out there. And understand that at the end of the day, the one thing that will probably keep it out, it, it, keep me out, is not your tools, but your employees not clicking on something. Great. So, <laughs> so one of the things that we debate fairly frequently is outsourcing. And if we were to outsource a technology, is that the equivalent of outsourcing our risk? No. <laughs> um, one thing, yeah. yeah um, if you can't tell, we kind of can answer these questions. Um, this is one I hear all the time. Dave, I'm outsourcing my technology. I'm good. Understand when everything goes wrong, you're the one paying for it. Uh, risk, you have two things you can do. You can accept the risk, you can try to reduce it, or you can transfer it. Transfer it means buy insurance. Now this is, this is CISSP Security 101. Unless the vendor actually says to you, if you, we lose some of your data, we will financially reimburse you, you are still responsible. Now, I, I will say, um, I'm seeing people go down this road. They are rushing to the cloud. It, we have done a lot of stuff with the cloud. I would not even put my grandma's recipe on the cloud right now. Take it with care. Uh, going to large search engines to host your email. Understand, you will never get them to sign any sort of agreement that says they're responsible for your information. In fact, quite the opposite. They're trying to say that your information is no longer private. So be very careful before you do this. Yeah, I'm afraid we, we get that uh, when, when having just a intellectual discussion on the need for cyber coverage, <clears throat> that we outsource our credit card processing to a third party, or we outsource our email to a third party. Uh, and therefore, we transfer the liability. You have it. Uh, it's your data. It doesn't matter that you are outsourcing where, where it's housed. As, as Dave said, unless you have some identity in that third party, it's still data that you own. You're responsible for it. You're liable for it. And uh, so outsourcing is um, you know, certainly uh, in both, but it doesn't protect you in this particular situation. Uh, to, to be adequately protected, you can either retain the risk or you can transfer the risk. That's <coughs> where uh, you know, the, the insurance product potentially comes into play. So I have a question that isn't canned. So since it was our system that you hacked into, I um, didn't. well, but you know, but that you that you mocked, um, and and I'm sitting here saying to people, 
Okay, will you please sign up for the daily email updates? Um, <laughs> how can I get them to sign up for the daily email updates and not feel that they're vulnerable? Right, um, and the reason and the reason I said you weren't hacked is this is something I see all the time. People go, oh, I'm getting emails, I'm, I'm hacked. And this could have been from Barack Obama. It could have been from me, but understand the vulnerabilities in the technology that my server that I sent it to didn't know I wasn't telling, didn't know I was sent this business trip. So understand it first. If you see information like that, an email coming from someone, it doesn't mean their systems were hacked. It just means that someone got their email address. It's easy. Um, this is one of the big problems. We say be on guard, be on guard, but then we even do this. Here, here's a website. Let's click on it. Um, this is where stuff like digital certificates are not a bad thing. For a business, it's $100 a person. If I'm sending emails out all the time, what this is, is this is proof I am who I say I am. And on my email system, if I got something from Ellen and I saw her digital signature, I could actually, through Outlook or whatever the, Outlook, uh, whatever the email program is, click on it, and it would say this is valid. There are other things to help us. But the key here is trust your gut. Instinct helps you more than anything. There are many, many times when we, can, when we come in and we do these attacks that people go, I didn't think that I should have done. Well, then don't. If you have any doubt, reply. Okay, so hey, I replied to that, it will have gone to Ellen. If I can send you an email as your boss. Kind of weird, reply back. Hey, no, don't reply back. Oh, <laughs> are you crazy? But reply back. Okay. And if he goes, I didn't send that, it's going to help. Understand emails, web, and caller ID can all be spoofed easily. And there's tutorials on YouTube on how to do it. So just always use your guide. So I guess I should say that's why we ask for your business card before we send you that email update because actually what you might realize is that by signing up for the seminar, we have all your emails. Um, and we don't do that because we don't want to either be spamming you or setting anybody up for anything. So if you give us your cards, then you'll know that you asked us to um, sign you up. I've learned a lot today, um, including how to ask for cards. Um, I hope you've learned a lot. Brian and Dave, thank you very much. And thank you for staying around. Thank you. This video was produced by iCast Studios. For more, go to iCastStudios.com.